welcome everyone to Voice of the Product, an interview series of leaders of organizations who are embracing product-led growth. Today, we have Liz Kane, partner at OpenView. Liz also sits on the investment committee and also uh, leads the expansion platform. She has a background in sales, in sales operations, customer success, and also inside sales. Uh, recently, before OpenView, she was the AVP of Worldwide Business Development at NetSuite. So Liz, thank you so much for being here. Thank you guys for having me, really excited. So I'm most excited to talk to you about how your background in sales has sort of interfaced with your adoption of product-led growth. But Absolutely. before we get into that, let's talk a little bit about your time at NetSuite. So um, while you were there, you helped expand an outbound program or create an outbound program from an organization that was historically purely inbound. Can you talk about a little bit about um, um, how that timing was was right to do that. So this was right at the end of 2011. It was really Q4 and we were starting to think about sort of what came next in planning for 2012. Uh, we were a public company and we had gotten to a couple hundred million in revenue with just strictly a direct sales team and an amazing marketing and demand gen group that was just funneling inbound leads to that team. Um, they were just cherry picking, like pulling out the leads that like they thought were best. And it's pretty amazing when you think that about that kind of to. scale of growth. Yeah. Um, a scale of that size company with still that practice in place, like amazing. You don't see it today. Um, but at the time we were like planning for 2012 and we realized we just did not have enough leads or the growth in leads to continue to support the kind of hiring we were looking at on the sales side and the revenue targets. So we started exploring what that could look like. At the same time, we had hired a new leader into the executive team in sales who was really focused on bringing a outbound practice in. Mm. Started with his own team, trying to get his reps prospecting, and then was also just banging the table asking for a BDR group because he had had one at his last um, company. So I actually kind of came into NetSuite through a college hiring program at OpenAir, which was subsequently acquired by NetSuite. And that was back in 2008 and uh, had kind of been through that cohort model, come in with a bunch of other people right out of college. And when the CEO came to us, he was looking for somebody who had kind of been through the model and had been a success story and could go build it again. Mm. And so that was end of 2011 and we started hiring our first class of BDRs. Um, year one was all about kind of figuring out that inbound lead qualification model. How do we get the right leads in the hands of the sales reps, make sure we have SLAs in place, nothing's falling through the cracks, mm -hmm. and then starting to evolve the outbound model. Who should we be going after? What segments? Who are the right buyers? Um, and figuring out what messaging really worked. Learned a lot those first couple of years. And it, you also expanded over those first couple of years. Dramatically. I heard that you hired on, or your team hired on, 380 folks over four years. Yeah, it was aggressive growth. Can you talk a little bit about what the uh, profile of person looked like from those initial hires? Yeah, for sure. So the growth at that time was just really like, just super expansive. It's kind of crazy. When I first started that team, I my biggest concern was that we would get to the end of their like 12 months in the program and there'd be nowhere for them to go in the organization. Mm. We wouldn't have enough roles. And what it turned out was like, people were like begging to hire them, we're pulling them into roles and we ended up having to hire much faster than planned. So. Early on, we basically looked for four traits in somebody. We looked for sales skills, patterns of behavior, horsepower, and cultural fit. Mm. So to break those down a little bit, sales skills, kind of a funny one when you're coming out of college. You're like interviewing somebody who's 21 who like <laughs> hasn't really had a job before and we're like, you can't ask the usual things, right? And tell me about the biggest deal you've closed. Mm. Um, so we had to come up with some more creative things. So we were looking for people who had had some tough jobs, who had worked in customer service, who were, you know, had faced some difficult conversations, who were naturally competitive. Um, and you just, you just kind of like got that feeling when you were talking to someone. Um, but it wasn't necessarily like has played sports or the competitive spirit. And like, I think the way a lot of people talk about it, like, mm. Maybe you were like really into chess. I don't know. But like you had this kind of competitive bone in your body. Um, the second thing, uh, looking at patterns of behavior, really like how they make decisions and how that happens over time. Were they thoughtful? Did they gather facts? Do they, you know, work with others well? Um, and how would that actually like make us feel about their business judgment? Mm -hmm. Will we trust this person in the role? Uh, and then the third is horsepower. And that was probably the most important one to me. Um, we were selling a very complex product. We were selling accounting software to CFOs. We were never gonna be the expert on the phone. So we needed someone who was intelligent enough to hold their own and then had the motivation to wake up every day, to pound the phones, to get rejected and to come back the next day excited to do it all again. 
Um, and then the final one we looked for is fit and culture. Mm -hmm. And the reality of that one is we weren't looking for somebody that you would like want to take out for a beer after work. You didn't need to be friends, but you did need to add something to our work culture. Mm -hmm. And we wanted kind of that unique perspective and somebody, each person bringing something to the team. Over the four years that you were hiring um, and the classes got bigger and bigger, what did it look like in terms of what you were looking for? Did that change and iterate at all? Yeah. Hiring at that kind of scale is really hard. Mm -hmm. We got much better at some things and a lot of us were doing so many interviews that you could really quickly have that pattern recognition and just like understand who was going to be like intuitively a great fit. Uh, and then we had a lot of new managers. So we were onboarding people so fast. We had a team of 12, you know, first or second time managers who were hiring these people. And you had to like kind of play the line and balance between letting them own their own team, make the decisions and build a culture in their office. And then also how that aligned to the broader team. Mm. It wasn't kind of one or the other. And so we definitely made some hiring mistakes. We ended up buying a tool called HireView, which was recorded interviewing software. Mm. And it allowed us to basically do game film coaching. So I could go listen in and see how that manager in Austin was running an interview and how they were evaluating a candidate and see if that would compare to or how that would compare to how I would do it or how my manager in Chicago would do it. And so we used to kind of do that both ways. Managers would listen to us, we would listen to them, um, and we would kind of like refine that hiring process over time. I would say it didn't really change all that much. Um, we continued looking for the same qualities. We wanted a diverse background of people that just kind of shared some similar traits. Mm. And over the last five to eight years, what have you seen change in the sales organization? A lot. Um, yeah, it's funny. If I like wind back eight years, I feel like we were, we definitely weren't at the earliest days of Outbound, but like it was still really productive and like a lucrative game. Like you could get a lot for doing Outbound dials. Um, so over the last few years, I guess first we saw like a way over reliance on BDRs. I think that direct sales teams just went all in on segment segmenting and specializing and getting each role to do like the smallest thing that they could. And that was a lot of BDRs. Um, from there, I think we saw the rise of a number of different kinds of technology, particularly around gathering contact information and email cadences, mm. which means the response rate and the open rate on email has just plummeted. And so it's made outbound much harder. And I think we're seeing the same thing with LinkedIn now. Um, and then I think the last thing that's really changed is the buyer like and the buyer's behavior. And I think that we're in this evolution where we're seeing where the budget sits kind of roll downhill again. Mm. If you wind back 20 plus years, it sat in the hands of the CIO. It moved to like the line of business, the VP of sales, the VP of marketing could make their own decisions on technology and was more of an influencer to IT. And now I think it's kind of going one more step where the end user has way more of a say in actually what technology they're going to use to do their day-to-day -day job. And that changes how you sell. That changes how you sell a lot. So this works perfectly into my next question. You are a, were a self-described product-led growth skeptic, yeah. but something changed your mind. Can you talk a little bit about what it was? Yeah. My, I think it was my second week at OpenView. Um, we flew out to California. We were spending time with David Barrett, who's the CEO of Expensify, and he was telling me about sort of their sales strategy, which is we do not have salespeople. That was the strategy, right? Uh, and <laughs> Bold it's strategy. Unbelievable company. Like if you look at the growth and just the product, it's phenomenal. Um, and he was telling me, you know, we don't need salespeople. We are going to build like the best product there is. We are going to put it out there and then people are going to use it. And they are going to bring it back to the controllers and the VPs of finance. And they are going to say, we want this expense tool. And that is how we're going to sell the tool. I, I was like, that's not going to work. <laughs> that's not a thing. And it's amazing to watch what that company's done and then subsequently, um, you know, to be exposed to so many other companies that are doing it successfully. And I think that kind of comes back to the same thing I was describing before about, you know, the buyer really changing hands. Mm -hmm. It's almost the evolution of like the bring your own device to work, right? If you think back 10 years ago, you weren't allowed to bring your own cell phone and put it on the company plan or bring your own laptop. And now that's kind of the norm. And so I think if you think about how that evolves over time, it's really become bring your own application. You think about how do I solve the problem I have today? I Google it, I ask my friend, okay, that thing worked for you, I'm gonna try it. Mm -hmm. And as soon as it works for one person, it starts to proliferate and it moves through a team, then an organization, then a department, then a company. Um, and with those users having power, 
they now get to make decisions with like the swipe of a credit card rather than going through a nine month procurement cycle. I want to tell a story about how sales, marketing, and product can get aligned within a product-led growth organization. One morning, I woke up to an email. It was from one of the portfolio CEOs, and the subject line was hashtag WTF, and I knew it was going to be a really rough day. So I opened that email up, and it turns out the CEO had dug in and tried to figure out exactly what was going on in their buyer journey. He wanted to see how the salespeople were being onboarded, what tools they were using, and really like how they were engaging. So he went in, he onboarded as a sales rep, he went through the process, he started reaching out to customers, and what he figured out was they were using tons of technology that made the sales team's life easier, but they were not being thoughtful about how they engaged with their end user. So he was coming for us for help. How could we actually figure out how to align those teams and improve the buyer journey? So we at OpenView went out and did some mystery shopping. We signed up for their product for free trials through a couple of different email addresses and we just waited. What would happen? What we found is that we got 18 touches across seven channels in just four days. That is a crazy number of messages. We were getting messages from in-product messaging. We were having product emails. We were getting a webinar uh, invite from the marketing team. An SDR had put us into a cadence. We were getting asked to do a demo. Um, we were even being uh, texted by the product team. And it was all these conflicting messages that weren't driving us toward any clear end result. So we took a big step back. We realized that no one was doing this intentionally, right? Each step had been added with a very clear purpose. Someone thought, hey, texting could be a great channel for us. We should see if we can improve conversion. Or shouldn't, wouldn't it make sense for us to actually start a cadence where we give them an opportunity to engage or share some product advice? And over time, it just devolved into way too many messages with no thought for how they actually aligned. So we wanted to get those leaders together, take a first principles approach and figure out what are the right messages that actually drive a customer to make a purchase decision? What are the few things you can do or the fewest things you can do that actually get your user to see value in your product and ultimately become a customer? On a recent podcast that I heard um, from OpenView, you said that the number one mistake that startups make is pricing their product too low. So as companies embrace a product-led growth model and they start to maybe embrace a free trial or a freemium experience, how can they limit the whiplash of uh, providing a free service and then all of a sudden providing based on the value that they're offering a company? Yeah, it's one of the harder things to figure out is actually like what that price point should be, which I think is why companies start so low, mm -hmm. right? Like you just want to get the logos and get somebody in the door. Um, what we found is there's really kind of two ways to go at this. It's the free trial or the freemium model. I think there are ways to make both work. Um, I'm not sure that one is necessarily better than the other, but you can find ways to make it work within your business. The key though is providing value before you hit a paywall. And so it's figuring out what are the things that a user needs to do to actually see value in your product? What are the actions they need to take mm. in order to have that like aha moment and get excited and want more? And then that's when the paywall hits. <laughs> and I think the second thing you can do is actually start pricing low, but figure out what the levers are to increase price over time. So it, does it increase with usage? Mm. Are there additional paywalls that they hit? Is it feature-based? Is it user-based? There's a lot of different ways that they can actually grow. Um, one of the like slickest paywalls I've seen was actually in Slack mm. and everybody can download it and start using it. Obviously like inherently viral product because why do you want to chat tool if no one else is on the other end? I chat to myself all the all time. The time. Slack. <laughs> Notes? True. Yeah. I like that. Yeah. I've actually never done that. Okay. Um, but <laughs> when you hit like a limit of the number of words or you try to upload a file and access it, mm. that's when you get it. So it's, you know, you get to 10,000 messages and a little thing pops up and it says, um, you know, your archive messages will no longer be saved. Not that many people are actually searching the history of their chats, like 10,000 messages back, yeah. but you get scared. You see it and you're like, oh, I should do that. Right? I like this chat thing I'm doing. I want to keep doing it. And I'm not sure everybody actually internalizes what that means, but like it was a huge lift for them when they rolled out that experiment. Mm. Um, and there's a lot of examples of things like that, but I think it's all about finding what's the value, what's that aha moment, and then how do you continue to drive growth once you have the logo?
Awesome. And um, in terms of sales and product-led growth, first, I guess I want to ask, do product-led growth companies need sales teams? You talked about how Expensify decided to forego it. Do they have a sales team now? And, and do you think it's inevitable that teams will um, introduce sales at some point? I think even PLG companies have sales, but I think we call it something different. It's like blasphemy to call sales sales in a product-led company. Mm. Um, so what actually happens, you have the same people around the table, but what they're doing and the actions they're taking actually look really different. So if you actually think about what an inbound sales model looks like, it can be somewhat similar to that, but you're waiting for somebody to hand raise, you're waiting for someone to ask for help or to run into a friction point, and then you're jumping in and assisting them and you're helping them through the buyer journey that they otherwise would have taken. Mm. So in a product-led model, you're helping them find that aha moment, you're driving them to take that action that makes them see the value, and then you're assisting them if they need help in converting. The best products won't need that help, right? They'll be designed to have removed those friction points, but that takes a ton of time, and you're gonna end up plugging holes with people over, you know, especially the first few years, and then probably forever, but the key is to identify what those are and keep de, I guess, delaboring and removing the humans from that process, mm. not adding more. And and because the team is maybe not called sales or maybe looks different than a traditional yeah. sales organizations, how can you measure success? Yeah. So first of all, they're called lots of different things. I think customer success is probably the most common one, mm. but I've heard a lot of different ones at this point. Um, it's generally the team that's reviewing the inbound funnel, whether that's coming through free trial or for three through freemium or through PQLs, product qualified leads. Um, but measuring success is interesting. I think the outcome doesn't change. Ultimately, you're trying to drive the same thing. It's logo acquisition, retention of customers, you're managing to churn rates and net dollar retention. You're looking for growth in those accounts. Mm. It comes back to a revenue number. But the actions and what you're looking at as leading indicators are very different. You're not looking for the number of outbound dials. You're not looking at the number of emails. Instead, you're looking for the number of customers that are assisted in some way. Or you're looking at, I think the best companies are doing this, their ability to actually influence this like North Star metric. So I think if you, if you kind of wind back to that earlier principle, the idea of finding the levers that you can pull, there is a few things in every company that will actually drive someone to see value. So in Expensify, you want somebody to scan their first receipt. In Calendly, we want someone to schedule their first meeting. In Slack, you want someone to you know, chat their first person. In Zoom, it is like book your first meeting and actually start it up and it's really simple. Mm. That Those are the things that drive value. And so every action you do should be to drive people towards that moment. And so what you're looking for is really the conversion of people from new leads to that moment and then ultimately to paid. And I think those tend to be the leading indicators for sales. It's not about just the outcome and the revenue, but how do you get them through that kind of first hurdle? Does a company need to be product-led growth, product growth focused from the very beginning of the company or do you think larger organizations are able to pivot? It is a really hard one. Uh, I think, well, I've heard and I uh, think even within OpenView, there are varied opinions on that. And what I will say is it is way easier to start that way or at least to kind of make that pivot very early in your journey. I think it's very hard to have a culture that is built around an outbound sales motion or even an enterprise sales motion that pivots later. What I do think is larger, more established or enterprise companies can actually adopt product-led practices within their customer success account management teams and look more at the upsell mechanism mm. or how they spread internally. Um, but I do think it's actually very hard to get that motion going uh, at the front end if where you started was mid-market or enterprise. It's just a really tough inertia game to play with a sales force that doesn't understand it. Um, if you start that way, it is so much easier to adopt and build out some sort of enterprise team to serve your larger customers. We've had a number of our companies in the portfolio actually make that step, mm. product-led for a really long time, and then start to build out, you know, three, four, 10, 20 enterprise sales reps who are actually serving the largest customers, um, are helping to consolidate the accounts if needed, are getting those MSAs in place, but you know, years into the relationship, not before they've started seeing value and using the product. And so for companies that I guess are starting uh, initially with a product-led growth model, what's the biggest mistake that you see them making? People. So 
you always have friction points in your onboarding experience. And if you go back to the user and the buyer journey, I guess I should call the user journey that they're going through in order to buy your product, um, there are so many points where they can fail. Mm -hmm. And there are so many little things that are gonna deter them from actually getting through seeing value and swiping their credit card. And you need to continuously dissect what those are, but often those holes get plugged with a person. Mm. And it's really easy to just add more people to the process and not fix the core problem. Or once you've solved that one to go on and with a, with a person, to go on and find the next friction point because you're excited about the uplift you've seen. But people aren't as scalable, and it actually comes back to fixing the core product and aligning your roadmap around how you continue to remove friction for that user rather than always having a person plugged in and trying to help. Liz, what are some big changes that you're seeing uh, right now happening in the world that you're personally really excited about? I mean, it is product-led growth. When it comes down to it, we've been like really like thinking about talking about investing behind this idea for years and for it to be now this like pervasive idea that other people are talking about we are so excited to see that um just like a short anecdote so i was speaking at a conference a few months ago and i got up on stage and the first thing i asked was like by a show of hands how many people in the audience are from software companies and it was only like 20 percent of the audience so i had this like <laughs> All right, now what moment? Uh, the organizers have told me it will be mostly software, and I had a speech prepared, and I was like, all right, well, like I'm giving it anyway. Like <laughs> There's nothing I can do. I'm here. So I gave my talk about product-led growth and how it integrates with sales and kind of what companies should be thinking about to adopt these practices. And when I got off, this guy was waiting to talk to me. And he comes over and he's like, Liz, you know, your talk moved me. Like I am really excited. I want to try this with my team, but I can't figure out how it works. And so I was like, all right, well, like, let's chat for a second. And it turns out that he ran sales for a carpet distributor. Hmm. And he was like all in. He wanted to know how product-led growth applied to his business. So we had to get a little bit creative to come up with some ideas. But I do think it's pretty natural for almost every software company now. Interesting. And what were a couple ideas, I imagine, like carpet samples? There were or... samples. They were designing some rooms. We were stealing ideas from Havenly. I don't mm. know if you know that one. Oh, yeah. Um, but thinking about how they can actually like provide some value up front. It's a lot harder than doing it with a software <laughs> company, but there was some interesting stuff there. Create software for carpet companies. Yeah, why not? <laughs> awesome. Well, Liz, thank you so much for being here today and sharing your time with us. It was awesome to be here. Thank you. And thank you for spending your time with us as well. Don't forget to subscribe to the Product Led Growth Collective for more information on everything product-led growth and have a great rest of your day.